available on all podcast platforms. This is the Psychology Cast, the podcast that interviews unique individuals on why they do what they do. Welcome back to Psychology Cast. This time we're joined by PhD student Zenab, who is doing some fascinating work in the research area in psychosis, particularly in communities that I'm familiar with. Uh, welcome, Zenab, to Psychology Cast. Thank you so much for being here, and hopefully we're going to be learning and hearing from your insights. Thank you for having me, Jolo. It's a pleasure. Now, for our audience, Zenab, um, tell us a bit about yourself, like where are you based, um, and what is your what work you're doing at the moment? Yeah, so I am a third year PhD student at the University of Bradford, but I am also embedded within the Bradford District Care NHS Foundation Trust. So I have an honorary contract with them and I am, you know, forming these partnerships with them to kind of get this research underway and um, and out there for marginalised communities, uh, or in my case, um, the, the work that I'm doing focuses on British South Asian uh, Muslim communities, uh, particularly families who have experienced, or if a family member has experienced psychosis, then um, my PhD kind of looks at how their experiences um, to accessing accessing family interventions have kind of um, helped their journey or on the contrary how they might have impeded their journey and when you say south asians are we, when you say british south asians um which particular group just for our audience um so who do we refer to in this context yes yeah, so um when i talk about South Asians so we, we 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 have this misconception actually that South Asians are you know they are very much homogenized under mm. one umbrella term um when actually there are many differences even within the groups um so for my you know particular PhD it's it's focusing around um Pakistani and Bangladeshi Muslims uh, because that's what the you know the the research points to, um, you know they are disproportionately um, more susceptible to experiencing psychosis as opposed to their white counterparts, and so of course you know that that warrants the, the research within the field of psychosis to see why those discrepancies um, are so prevalent, and what we can do from a service perspective to kind of um, ensure that there is equitable service uh, available for this for this community. And that's why I became fascinated in your work really when I came across you um, <clears throat> at a conference um, because it's something that most people don't talk about, what well, the people I've come across haven't talked about. So when you talked about it from, mm -hmm. I remember being a panel speaker at the conference yeah. up in um, Yorkshire actually. Um, for those who are wondering, it's like north, it's not northeast, but it's like north of um, yeah. that side of the world, isn't it? Yeah. Um, how, well, I suppose, what, why do you think they, they are susceptible to psychosis, like, in your opinion? Like, why do you think we, South Asians have it, experienced yeah. these? Um, I guess we can look at it from many uh, different perspectives, Jolo, um, you know, the research points towards um, things such as Islamophobia, racial discrimination, um, and actual, you know, wow. okay. yeah, yeah, racial discrimination is up there, yeah, you know, um, yeah. because With that, psychosis. yeah, yeah, it, it, okay. it contributes yeah. towards the onset of, of psychosis. Um, you look quite shocked there. Uh, I, I, I share that as well when I read it in the um, in the literature uh, yeah. I expected Islamophobia to be up mm. there but racial discrimination is quite you know it's um it's definitely something uh well it is very interesting um to kind of look into further but yeah um 
those kinds of things. But then also, I think within the actual South Asian Muslim community, they do inadvertently perpetuate the onset of psychosis without actually realising um, whether that's through a lack of, of knowledge, um, the stigma around mental health as a whole within this community. Um, more so, I, I, I mean, it's probably quite foolish of me to say the South Asian Muslim community because Islam does actually promote uh, mental well-being and, you know, looking for ways to remedy poor mental health. And I think where the issue really lies is within the South Asian community, um, who more often than not, they do take culture as the deciding factor, as opposed to religion. And so you find this, this clash between what your faith teaches and what your culture uh, demands. Um, when in actual fact, it should be the, your faith that's taking precedence in all of your life choices. Um, so, yeah, I think I think there's a there's a mixture of, of of two really important things here. So it's the the societal factors, mm -hmm. as I just mentioned, but then it's also on, on a communal level as well um, within the community. Yeah, there's two. I mean, there's the, the, the what you've said, like you know, did resonate with with even before when you were, we discussed about these things when we met, because it did, for those who are new listeners will know that um, what well, those who are old, old listeners or current listeners will know that I run a mental health charity. We look at faith based perspe uh, faith based perspectives and approaches to mental health care because we know that actually all the faiths. Um, promote and enhance well-being that's why it's there for to seek tranquility to seek peace and mm -hmm. to find yourself and so it's used as a way to go about your life and how it can be implemented but the other bit is like you're saying <clears throat> which is what we can resonate with is one well what happens when things go wrong you need the right infrastructure and services to help people from those people from backgrounds but two there is that sort of um, you know literacy work that um, that we need to do inside the community in these spaces, if you like, because they can start to label it in in very um, you know derogatory terms, and that can stigmatize the space yes, and yeah. the people around them. And as we know, and the key drivers to mental illness, as we know, are are discrimination and stigma. So you cover them both yeah. under this discrimination <laughs> and stigma, and then yeah. you wonder where we got this problem. But I never knew. Well, it's not. I'm not saying. I've not come across it as much, or it's not been highlighted as much, which shows there's a gap here around the first bit you were saying around the discrimination side, because and the links to psychosis, because normally yeah. it's talked about stigma and lack of medication, and you know, it focuses on those things. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't focus on actually. There's a wider societal sort of contribution here. Yeah, no, definitely. I think this it's not it's not something that's novel. Um, if you actually look at the history of psychology, um, you know, it, the views of privileged white males were predominantly put on that pedestal, which then led to very Eurocentric um, Western models of mental health. Mm. And then that's contributed towards um, a lack of engagement from marginalized communities such as South Asian Muslims because they go to these mental health services and it's not to say that mental health services in their current form aren't looking to you know Intention help these communities yeah. yeah and eradicate this discrimination there's a lot of work going on you know to to help yeah. promote inclusivity and equitable um care but at the same time, we can't ignore the fact that psychology dating back, you know, centuries ago from the likes of Sigmund Freud, who actually very much stigmatized faith and religion and, you know, equated that with neuroticism. So you can imagine then how these Western Eurocentric models are completely incompatible with South Asian, 
not just South Asian, any ethnic minority community who holds faith in a very, you know, high regard. Um, and I think that's where my work comes into it to see it's not about shoving faith in people's faces. It's about allowing the South Asian community to have that choice because not everybody's going to want to have faith in the room with them when they're talking about poor mental health. Yeah. People, some people might yeah. like to keep it separate. Yeah. But if they're not allowed the choice, mm. then how will we ever know whether faith is actually a predictor of, you know, positive or um, good mental health, specifically when it comes to psychosis and family interventions? Because, you know, the family is a is a is a huge part of the South Asian community. You know, the collectivist culture. We expect to have, we have expectations of family members to pull their weight. But if mental health services can't recognise that from a cultural point of view or a, or a faith based point of view, then we run the risk of estranging these communities um, from these services and, yeah. and marginalising them. And then leading to, sorry, I've just interrupted you there. No, no, but, yeah. but um, you know, it's, kind of reinforcing that discrimination that they experience on a, on a societal level and it's something that you wouldn't expect to see within statutory services but and it's and I'm I'm not making any assumptions here that the, the services deliberately do this but you know instit institutional racism does exist even in 2024 it does exist and if we're not open to having these uncomfortable conversations then we cannot move forward and and have these equitable um services and channels of care for for all members of you know bradford <laughs> absolutely well I was on the question i want to and i totally agree with you i think i think the question my dog says like in psychology we have things like social identity Oh, yeah, so yeah. I always wonder why why do people why, you know why do why they ignore it even it's in the literature right? like mm -hmm. it's it's published in this space and it has lots of like you know peer reviewed you know work around this and yeah. you know everyone talks about it but when it comes to these spaces it's somehow it's just like it's not even on the menu at all like it's not even discussed but there's the connection there are psychological theories yeah. to support you know um, these sort of arguments and these positions right. Yeah. backed up by you know empirical evidence and so the social identity that really picks out and say well of course if the person is from a certain group or a community or you know because we make as we know we make decisions collectively yeah. whether we you know being a muslim um it could be like food is this is this meat is this meat prepared in the right way for example that's a collective decision we all have to agree because i'm not you know making the meat the other person is based collective thinking yeah, yeah. yeah um, no, no definitely um i think there is a real sense of um oh i'm, I'm kind of lost for words now you put you put me on the spot there with right. the um <laughs> it's it's i think collectivist communities such as south asian uh, community they are very much one you know and when they feel threatened by that mm. and they feel as though their needs aren't met whether that's within healthcare services or any aspect of life then they won't i mean this is a, a normal concept of life they won't feel comfortable going to those very services to seek help no. so you know, this is where this entire mistrust and um, lack of engagement with these services comes into it. Because if 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 you see that the services aren't receptive to um, faith based models or culture based models, then they're just going to see that. Oh well, I can't relate to this. But then they will go to an imam or seek out those faith-based treatments, even though sometimes it might not just be a faith-based problem. 
Mm. You know, you mm. might need, a, 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 you know, both a mental health um, approach and a faith-based approach. Mm. But by not really? having that within the service to begin with, you are completely, you know, again, I, I, I want to emphasise this. It's not deliberate, but the services are turning people away. Well, it, then that's, it becomes exclusive. Mm. The service is only exclusive available for certain people and not for the others. And yeah. you're right, you're right. The problem is the problem, isn't it? The problem doesn't go away. The person's going to go and still seek help from another space because yeah. the problem is still there. So if yeah, you got exactly. a bit of a wound and you go to A&E and the A&E say, yeah, we can't take you, uh, you still got the wound, you're going to take that mm. wound to another place like a chemist or whatever. Yeah. Uh, do it yourself, perhaps, and most people do it. In our charity, that's the problem that we've got. So a lot of them, what happens is they come to us yeah. and we hear about their journey and we're thinking, what's happened? Like, how come this, you know, why why haven't you gone to the services? It's been, you know, paid for by taxpayers' money and things like that. And, you know, you've got the number, you know where it is. Why they keep coming to us? And we have no problem with that. Of course, we keep our doors open for everybody, for all faiths okay. and, none, and none, of course. But then you wonder what's happening in the other space. Yeah. What's happening in the other space? Just for listeners, just in case um, wondering why there was a pause, there's a bit of a lag. Uh, but then I went back. You can hear me. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there was. No, that's a, fine. Yeah. It just kind of froze there. Um, yeah. No, yeah, it's, it's, you know, and I, and I bring it back, Joel, to what I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I've been working on a systematic review um, and exploring mm -hmm. South Asian Muslim communities. Uh, understanding of psychosis to see how we can then translate that into culturally adapting family interventions for psychosis and you know there were three main themes that were identified from this work which was cultural frameworks of sense making so you've got your stigma your shame um your sense of pride um the influential role of family in the perception of psychosis which as i touched upon it's a collectivist community and so family does play a huge role in in every aspect of life um, and the final one was navigating psychosis through a spiritual and faith-based lens so you do see that even in the literature the literature that I've synthesized there is the need for a spiritual and faith-based uh, approach within current mental health services because you know I mean, I found that the younger generation are adopting, they're kind of not turning away from spiritual uh, aspects, but they're open to other perspectives, such as, you know, clinical explanations of poor mental health. Um, but there was still very much that need that what I found in the, in the systematic review is there is there is still very much a need to focus on faith-based um, treatments um, in order to facilitate that understanding between the practitioner and the family mm. you know and, and give them that that better sense of understanding that actually faith is a huge predictor of good mental health and not only that, but it's kind of, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm discussing my systematic review findings here now um, from the perspective of younger, um, the, the younger South Asian Muslim British uh, community who, as I, I don't want to say reject because that is quite a strong word, but look for alternative explanations. Um, rather than faith but you need to ask why that's the case you know why are these discrepancies between the older generation and the younger generation and i think one you know explanation could be that the younger generation do struggle to reconcile the values of their muslim identity uh, with those of their own british identity and you know by extension the non-muslim majority 
you know, they've even though they are British citizens, to some extent, they they do need to um, acclimate, if that's the right word, to the culture that they are. They've always known, but then that begs the question: Well, how do I hold on to my faith and my core beliefs of Islam and what my faith teaches me? So, you know, that might be one reason why they they don't want to. It's not a case of not wanting to bring faith into the room, into mental health services, when, you know, if, if they do want to discuss poor mental health, it's a case of how comfortable they feel doing so because of, you know, the global events around us. You know, cases in Islamophobia have risen exponentially because of, um, you know, the attacks that were in the South Port. Um, oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, just in case and, um, anyone's wondering, um, this is 2024. We're record, recording this episode, and it is the summer of the race riots so in Southport was one of yeah. the one of the key triggers that led to the race riots. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Zena. Yeah. No, no, it's 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 fine. But I think we need to consider these, you know, these perspectives from the younger South Asian Muslim community. In a in in a way that's kind of reflective of these societal issues and these global issues, because you know, for someone like me, who, for example, went into a mental health, um, you know, for counselling, let's just say, and they, you know, the counsellor wasn't very aware of my religious background or my faith, I would automatically be deterred I would not feel comfortable talking about my faith because another thing is microaggressions sometimes we might not realize how our body language or facial expressions or the way we react to a certain piece of news actually impacts the other person and how they how much they're willing to then share about their faith or other aspects of their identity yeah the models say client-centered therapy Client centered approach, yeah. right? Person centered. They always say, so we're not, we, do you know I mean, that bit of it's right, right? And then you get this other bit. So you're thinking, why aren't people following their own models? Like, that's why I find fascinating. Like, surely if you're using a client centered approach, right, you should take the whole person, like who they are and stuff like that. So why are you, like you said, this is, it might be like a microaggression in these, in these spaces, isn't it? To say, actually, you're trained in client centered therapy, person centered counseling person-centered approach everything's on your website or your you know as a provider you say you do this then when it comes down to it there's this bit where when it comes to the faith oh it's not person-centered anymore it's it goes against it's a contradiction is what i'm saying is that, do you find that a bit of contradiction yeah um i think there is a contradiction um to some extent but as i mentioned at the start you know I do think mental health services are leaning, you know, they are, they have improved in that sense. You know, they have accepted that there needs to be more inclusivity and more equitable um, care that's being provided, which is why, you know, this PhD is, is as it's an embedded PhD with the trust. Um, and we're working very hard to kind of establish what needs to be done to ensure mm. services are culturally sensitive and culturally appropriate, you know, and we can't make these decisions for marginalised communities. It, and that's why my PhD is it's adopting an experience-based co-design approach to ensure that at every stage of this research, we have experts by experience who have actually, you know, LinkedIn. undertaken this intervention give us their feedback mm. so that these can be translated into um, manuals, you know, training manuals that will help future practitioners um, and just communities as a whole to see, to understand how we can improve mental health services for different marginalised communities. Um, you know, and this, this could be the starting point, you know, because I'm focusing on South Asian Muslims, but you know, we've got different faith groups within South Asian communities, such as Sikhs, Hindus. Um, and so if we, you know, if we look at one aspect 
of the South Asian um, community, then, you know, this will open doors for research in other aspects of and other, you know, exploring other faith based groups um, to see how they differ or what how their needs differ or are similar. Um, but I think it's important, you know, it, for, for this PhD, it was important to focus on uh, Muslims because, as I said, that is what the research has, has pointed towards, um, particularly with the Islamophobia and how that has, you know, and it continues to, to impact mental health. I think it's going to be a fascinating episode if we were to do one in the future, focusing on the findings of your research when you complete. I think we oh, can yeah. really go into what, what happened, what did you find? And yeah. so we're going to have that conversation. I think that'll be really useful for the audience and audience mm -hmm. members who are listening to the show. It's, it's, what do you think? Like, you know, do you think that this is all connecting with yourself? You've got some questions, have think about it. But while you're doing that, I wanted to use the, the next part or the <clears throat> second part of the ep this episode, talking more about your own motivation, your own journey. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks, Isana, for sharing um, the research. Um, I'm sure we'll ca catch up on, see how what the findings are. I'd be fascinating myself um, to know what they are, because it fits in with cognitive social psychology. Oh, you know, absolutely. it's our home, so it's the perfect home for it. Yeah. Now, the question I've got for you is, why did you do this? Like, what, what would you choose this area of psychosis and looking at South Asians? Like, what, what, what prompted you? What motivated you? Because I know I have my own motivation. I know what I've shared this with you. You yeah. know, a lot of people that I know are close to me um, uh, have mental health problems, and um, I chose not to do it as a because it's too close to home in that regard. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but I still do pieces of work around it in the preventative side. Uh, but why? Why did what prompted you? What was your main motivator? Yeah, it's a it's a very good question, and it's a question I I receive quite a lot. <laughs> so you know, my my one number one motivation for pursuing a PhD is very much grounded in my faith. So, and you know, my friends can tell you this; those closest to me will tell you this. That for me, it's not just a PhD. It's not just tokenistic in the sense that I'm chasing a title. Yes, I'm going to be a doctor. That's a bonus. But the main thing for me is that I am leaving behind a legacy for my afterlife. You know, knowledge Islamically, you know, I'm, I am a, a practicing Muslim, not perfect, but, you know, I strive every day to be a better Muslim, a better believer. And Islamically, um, knowledge is seen as charity mm. and in Arabic uh, ongoing charity translates to Sadaqa Jariya so you know some some people ask me why would you put yourself through three or four years of absolute agony what what, what is keeping you going you know because you have days you know you'll know mm. better than anyone doctor <laughs> that you have days where you just cannot even look at your laptop yeah. it's it's just you can do anything else but your phd and it's fine to feel like that but i bring it back to my my faith what keeps me going is the fact that i am doing this for the sake of god so that on the day of judgment i have something to present to him and to say look this i tried my best i tried my best but here it is and you know I, I hope that you're proud of me. And everything else, honest to God, Joel, it's secondary for me. It's not chasing the fame. Look, honour. Who is the source of all honour and all glory? It's God. So if you seek to please God and try to earn his pleasure in whatever you're doing, then that honour comes to you. You know, you don't need to chase it. You know, You don't need to pretend to be someone that you're not. Because God sees everything. And if the intention is there, if the intention is pure, then surely he will definitely open those doors for you. He will guide you through the hardest times of your life. You know, you 
you might think that you know God on the mountain tops where everything is mm. fine, but you actually get to know him in the valley, you know, in the darkest time that, you know, everything is decreed by God. You know, this conversation that we're having, it was decreed by God. But it's difficult to understand that sometimes when, you, when you're in the thick of it. But if you've got that, that solid reason why, you know, and mm. I say this to prospective PhD students as well, if you've got your reason why, and it needs to be something more than I want to be a doctor, sorry to everybody listening who, <laughs> who, who wants yeah. to pursue a PhD just to be a doctor. I'm sorry, that's not going to get you to the end. You need yeah. to think of a more substantial, significant reason, one with actual substance behind it you know and, and sorry I've gone off on a bit of a, bit of a tangent there no, Jordan, no. but, but as powerful. I say yeah it's it's my faith and I hope Oof. that you know it's it might this PhD it's helped me cultivate a deeper me, more meaningful relationship with God um I wake up every single day grateful for the opportunity even though some days as I said don't want to look at the laptop but mm. it doesn't negate the fact that I am so, so, so beyond grateful that I am doing something that I actually enjoy and I am putting out, you know, knowledge that will help people for, for years to come. When, when, when would you say, like, when did you realise this, would you say? Would it, was it through your undergrad days before like you, you start yeah. to think mm, my, this is my purpose or this is my path or, this is my direction I'm just thinking this is this is my this is what I'm going to do when when do you think that was just for the listeners though because they'll be in a similar position yeah, of like definitely. what to, what to do when yeah. does it happen so what was what's the story like for you though yeah um I would say probably not so much during undergrad um hmm. I, I would say I was very lost during undergrad in terms of what I actually want to pursue as a career. I The only thing that I knew was I enjoy psychology. Mm. I really enjoy psychology, but had I found an area of particular interest at that point? No. Um, it was during my master's year that I really sat and thought about um, what I actually want to do for my dissertation. And I wanted it, wanted it to be something that I could relate to and something that I, because when you're writing, Joel, you, for me, I can't write about nothing. You know, it needs to come from somewhere. You know, there needs to be some sort of influence behind it. And for me, it was Islamic psychology. So, and that's where I first kind of realised that, hang on a minute, I really enjoy this. Um, you know, my master's dissertation looked at, well, explored the relationship between um, COVID-19, perceived stress um, and age and Islamic psychology, uh, sorry, sorry, Islamic religiosity as well in the context of COVID-19. So when I, throughout that journey, it was just, everyone around me just seemed to be depressed you know when they were when they were working on their dissertations and mm. I was absolutely loving it because I found my passion that was my passion because I love my faith as I said I'm not a perfect Muslim but I love my faith and if you know I found a crossroads between my academic um passion which was psychology and my actual genuine love for my faith and so that then when I I mean I, I got a really good grade in my in my dissertation I don't know how that happened again it was it was all God um it was a favor from God but at that point I thought okay I actually have something here that interests me I can either pursue it through a PhD or I can go and work in a, in a clinical setting which for me is it's not I prefer the academic setting um and so it was at that point after I'd graduated my master's where it was actually my 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 um, supervisor who advised that I you know apply for it because I never in a million years would have thought that I would be sat here having this conversation with you about how I managed to you know get onto a PhD not just any PhD 
but a PhD that I'm genuinely passionate about and I genuinely care to make a difference here. Um, so yeah, it, it was my master's, the year of my master's, which really influenced me. You could tell even now, I remember you talking about it on the panel that time and mm. I thought, okay, there's a, there's a deep sort of um, connection here, meaningful connection. And I think that's really important when we, because the students that we teach, yeah. And the people they come across, it's like they're asking these questions of like, well, how did they find their, you know, purpose or their passions or their needs? I'm like, well, listen to these people. Look mm -hmm. how they've done it. You're, so it's interesting that you said about it was more of the masters because the undergrad is like the foundation, isn't it? They give the foundation psychologists the information yeah. and then yeah. the actual bits comes afterwards. And then you paid attention to the stimulation that was coming through reading the articles, mm -hmm. um, just asking questions about this area. Yeah. That got you more excited, more energized, and you start to think, actually, I, I want to do this thing over here. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about people around you? Have they embraced it? So we're talking now about your social networks, mm -hmm. family and friends. How they've um, have they responded to your journey? Yeah, uh, another very good question. Um, I am very grateful, Joel, to have an extremely supportive network of friends, family. Um, I would like to say particularly my father, he has been a role model throughout my entire life. Um, he has been the, the trailblazer, you know, to show me what true success is. You know, he's the most resilient man that I've ever, you know, had the pleasure of, of knowing. Um, and he instilled the importance of, of, uh, integrity and work ethic, you know, the work ethic that my father has, I, I, I do not think any other man, you know, has that. Um, and I owe it all to him, you know, but after God, of course, um, my father is, is the man that I have been looking up to my entire life. I don't have any brothers. Um, so yeah, from a very young age, you know, I've, I've been watching him, um, give me the best quality of life that I could possibly ask for, you know, and his hard work, his dedication, his authenticity mm. as a man. Um, they're all qualities that I hope to, to, you know, mirror. And I hope that I'm doing him proud now with, with everything that I'm, I'm doing in this PhD. But yeah, my, my father is, is, he is like the backbone. Um, for me and my sisters, um, and even my mum, you know, he, he is the, he's a leader in more ways than one, and I'm very grateful to him. Um, I, I also think my friends are a huge, huge uh, driving force in, in getting me to where I am today. Um, as I say, again, after God, because, you know, God is the, the sole reason, but he is the one who places people in your life to get you to where you need to be. Um, my friends, you know, there's there's one particular friend of mine who's, who said it to me from the start when I was doing my master's. She said, I remember I was in her living room and she said to me, see if anybody can do a PhD, it's you. Um, and I just looked at her and I thought, are you, are you, stop it. <laughs> like, yeah. Quite the comedian. But no, you know, she's, she's helped me see that in myself. Um, and I'm so grateful to have people in my life who can see that in me, you know, and, and encourage that authenticity. Because if, if you don't have authenticity, Joel, you don't have anything. You know, you need to be authentic, authentic in all aspects of life. Um, you know, and always be committed to doing better. It's okay to make mistakes. None of us are perfect. but accepting those mistakes as opposed to just thinking you're always right nobody likes arrogance you know humility it's it's one of the doors to god so always 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 remembering where you came from and who was there for you at your lowest i think it's a, it's a it's a major takeaway uh, take home message here always remember who was there for you when you needed it the most, whether that's 
throughout your PhD or other aspects of your life, do never, never ever forget those people because they deserve a whole chapter in your story of who you're becoming. I think that's so powerful, like meaning, because I was going to ask you that question, like towards the end, what message you want to leave behind for our listeners? So like, because they'll be on that similar sort of thought processes, that journey yeah. and, you know, that relatability that you've given. It's been so, you know, um, very inspirational for me. I, I, I can resonate with, with, with a lot of it. And, you know, it's a conversation definitely for a different time. And I'm sure like all those people who are supporting you, they'll be so moved to hear what you what you've just said. Um, I think it's really important because we come from a, that space, isn't it? We acknowledge our environment, acknowledge our people. It's who we are. Um, so I just want to give the any final the more final mic to you if you do want to add anything else. Um, yeah. I'll put all the details of how do people get in contact with you in the description and stuff so people can reach out to you. And I'm sure we're going to meet in the future. But for now, the microphone is over to you. And <laughs> I want you to stop talking. I'll stop recording. Thank you, Joel. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I, I just want to finish by saying always stay true to who you are as a person. Your principles and your values are your greatest asset. If you're a person of faith, um, you know, your faith should always take precedence. But it's those faith based principles and values that should always govern your life. So if you're stuck between two decisions to take, always take the decision or always make sorry the decision that will earn the pleasure of god you know you're not here to serve yourself you are here to serve god and by extension serving god you are serving people it's through god that you serve people you know it's not about yourself in this you know be as selfless as you can because Yes, with all the glory and, and the fame, if you like, that comes with, with the life of a PhD student, you always have to remember, as I said previously, where you came from and who gave you this opportunity. It was God. So when you reach those high levels and those mountaintop moments of success, always, always, always reserve time for God. And for the people who are there for you because you know it's it's yes it's an individual journey but equally it's a collective journey mm -hmm. because you cannot be the person that you are today without the people who shape you as an individual mic drop <laughs> i like to leave it there Joel. that's my final um piece of the day <laughs> Thanks so much, Zainab. We'll see you shortly on the next episode in the future. And good luck with everything. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Available on all podcast platforms. This is the Psychology Cast, the podcast that interviews unique individuals on why they do what they do.